this is we've, we've conceptualized this as a sort of one day festival of the arts and scholarship and we've called it remains waste and metony a critical intervention into art and scholarship this event has been in preparation for at least six months and actually most of that seems to have happened in the last week <laughs> so if a couple of us are looking walking around like zombies that's because we've been working very hard so before i do anything else i want to say a couple of thank yous an enormous Sante San to everyone who's been involved. And there are indeed many, many different people involved. And I'm not going to do that Kenya thing where I name everyone individually, but I am going to highlight a few people. We have 10 installations here. That's actually enormous, right? And when we started planning this, we had no idea that this was what it would become. And I think it's a testament to the spirit of all the contributors that we did come together and we had a series of meetings, and there really was a, a real sense of collaborative spirit. And I think, so first of all, I need to thank all the contributors for making it happen. It's, it's really quite an achievement. Very finally, this is about an unfinished process. So we are already beginning to think about a follow-up event next year. And I very much hope that people here and the discussions that we have will feed into what that event next year will take, what it will look like. And so if you want to be involved, come and talk to us. I think that's all I want to say. Enjoy the day, and I'm looking forward to talking to you. I'm an artist and a sculptor to begin with. And uh, the study I had here was about, as you know, the topic is about waste remains and metonymy. Uh, in my part, I thought of playing the part of waste and, uh, and the remains. The remains are... Are, uh, are evident in the board which I, I used, and the issue of metonymy. Metonymy is more um, is more of presenting something to um, to like show what was there, but it's not really there. But in that sense, when you see the leg, you must identify it with the with the rhino. First of all, it's a rhino leg. A right hand, a right hand of the rhino. I will call it a hand because he only has legs, but they are the four ones. So my study began when I, it began a while back. That's when I started putting all this together, like the junk, and the junk and mixed and mixed media, different medias. That's the wood, and sometimes I go to extremes. I even do plastics and metals and all that. So in this instance, I decided my junk will be mostly chains and gears and, and that kind of stuff and a bit of wood to give it an organic feel. My name is Joyce Fontaine. I created this along with Fawaz. Who is Fawaz? Fawaz is the artist who's done these wonderful sketches and, and watercolors. And Mandela Samuel, he made the film. And the people you see there are the technicians from National Museums and Monuments who can't make that cast. Um, and that's the process that you, you see there. In fact, in that shot, you see the cast and the real thing. And they're incredibly talented, these people. So the idea for this, I think, began a year and a bit ago when I was at Olegasake, Olegasale? Yeah, I said it wrong, Olegasale. <laughs> With a friend of mine, Ted uh, Pollard, the former assistant director, and we came across an, uh, an elephant bone. You know, everything is mutually constituted, right? So it depends on a, 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 an osteologist would look at that bone differently to how you look at it. And the vitality of that material depends on that relationship. Place that. Uh, it's not by accident that these two nouns having a conversation. <laughs> it's uh, a frame is it's, it's something that owns a like a painting or a picture or I don't know. And so having this uh, light sh shown upon this empty frame, it's uh, again 
what is and what is not, what is imagined and what is real. Is the frame really empty? Is there something there that we're supposed to see that's not present? So people always have different interpretations of it. Like people were walking in here and they were like, oh, this is so calming. But I was going for more of it, you know? <laughs> I guess we didn't quite achieve the same thing. So, and it's fine. I get more into how bodies function, and particularly human bodies. And for this, it's about the microscope, really. To be honest. I'm fascinated by what microscopes, what kinds of narratives microscopes can create. What they tell you about your body, what they tell you, they tell others, whether it's in forensic labs, whether it's um, in medical labs, or whatever it is that microscopes do to look through body cells or the insides of the human body. So I'm fascinated at the same time by what, how many times we die before we eventually do what we think is dying. Um, so for me, dying is what my body loses and dies on its own. So my hair, my nails, my bodily fluids, my blood, I mean like all the stuff that you leave behind but then you are not eternally dead, dead in that way and I'm talking about this life for those who believe in another life, I believe in this one. Um, so what, whatever it is that dies and what happens to it and what meanings we can give to it outside the context of itself. So for instance, if for some reason my strand of hair is found at a crime scene, it stops just being dirt. It requires another meaning because that becomes evidence. So that is fascinating for me. So then for questions of identity, I always ask people, what are you? Because I, I don't know who you are. And do you actually know who you are? Working together with a friend, we tried to approach the empty building as an archaeological site. And to imagine that rather than moving from one building to another, this archive of African art, which is in Germany, which is already a strange thing, uh, actually did vanish and disappeared. So that all we had left were the forensic traces that the objects had left behind in this building. So for example, what you see here are floors within the archive, um, where if you look closely, you can see the, the physical impressions of people walking, or the scraping of objects, or artists painting in, in some of the rooms. So the, the physical impact, the physical traces of the objects that um, have left behind. Also within, um, within this fiction, because it is of course fiction, the archive didn't vanish, it just moved down the road. But we imagined that all we were left behind with, if it had gone, then we would also be left with a digital database. So these objects here are um, 3D, 3D scans and prints of objects from the original archive. Um, go through it. Uh, and the premise of the book, which which tries to sort of encapsulate our, our imagined, um, our imaginations about a vanishing archive. With these 3D scans that we're left with, um, we propose to send these 3D scans to the um, countries where the objects originally came from, to institutions in those countries where the objects came from. Of course, Tracing the original owner of an object is very difficult. Often the idea of an original owner is itself like a fiction because there have been many original owners. Um, um, but nonetheless, many of these objects which, were in the, which are in European collections come from the African continent. Uh, so they spent $3 million building that facility there and they spent at least $20 million on building roads and within six years everything had failed and it had, this was out of use by 1976, the main facility and then one by one the storehouses all 
um, became dilapidated. Um, because basically their approach had completely failed to integrate itself into the environment of Turkana, the social environment, the economic environment, and the general um, environment, like the physical environment. Um, because Ferguson's Gulf, which is right next to where this big main facility was, uh, dried out uh, shortly after they built it. Are they closed sites? Yeah, they're all locked up. Um, so they were actually locked in 1976, and the, and the locks that were, put up, that were put on in 76 are still there. And no one has the keys. Um, there's a guy who is the, he's, in, he's employed by the Kenyan government. He's the steward of this site. He has one little office, and his job is to basically make sure no one's squats in it, because it's an asset for the government. Yeah. Uh, but he doesn't have keys to the locks, so it's, I had to jump through the window. <laughs> yeah, so the guy, uh, he said, I'm happy for, to go, for you to go and take pictures, but I actually don't have any keys. So I think I jumped through that window there. <laughs> As you can see, Annie has taken a number of photographs um, from areas associated with the Mao struggle. And this is now my own commentary, of course. Um, so don't think that these words are uh, what she said. Um, and now Yost, in his opening remarks, asked us to sort of reflect upon this and start conversations about what these remains, what the waste, what the metonymy that we're discussing really means. And I think that perhaps this exhibit, more than a lot of other exhibits, is really brought into the limelight in today's Kenya with the settlement of the Mau Mau case and also the creation of the Mau Mau Memorial asking what remains necessarily from those court cases. What are the effects of that? What was left out? And I think Annie's photos do a very good job in sort of discussing this in a very subtle way, in a way that I could never do as a very positivist social science researcher who would analyze the Mau Mau revolt as a very political uh, movement with socioeconomic determinants, things like that. Um, so I think that it's a really interesting piece because of that. Um, and the second and perhaps <coughs> final point that I'll make um, is that Annie's photos are truly beautiful. They're landscape photos, and landscape photography is difficult. And it's especially difficult when shooting on 35 millimeter film, which Annie did. Because there's no way to go back and check to see that you got the right image to crop, and to make sure that the colors are right and that the lighting was right. But as you can see, Annie's photos are all individually stunning. And so I think that we should all give her maybe a round of applause for the very moving and wonderful exhibition that she sent to us.